18 months ago, Kevin Lewis's undercover interview with a local phony beggar confirmed many people's gut instinct. Kevin's award-winning series, The True Payout to Panhandling, showed just how lucrative a business begging can be. It also displayed the nasty underbelly and the skill of soliciting motorists. You think that's too generic? Should I should I put the father to you think or something along those lines or? Yeah, yeah. Try try try. Have you ever been hungry? With a question mark, man, you get tons of money. Man. To most everyone's applause, our series took the life out of local panhandling for nearly a year. But time heals everything, and if you live in St. Joseph County, it goes without saying street soliciting is back in full swing. And so for the last two months, we've tracked seven beggars to see if the story on their signs matches the reality of their lives. Kevin joins us now in the studio with the findings of his new series, Profiling a Panhandler. Kevin? Mo, we all know the cardboard trigger phrases, father of three kids, veteran army, need work, God bless. And while a select few of these brief biographies do check out, most are an unethically guided fraction of the truth. The morning routine can be monotonous. Five days a week, you cover miles of blacktop to your place of business. Meanwhile, beggars stand on the sidewalk, using the art of guilt to attack your generosity. So New Center 16 went undercover and staked out half a dozen panhandlers at four hotspot intersections across Mishawaka and South Bend. Our investigation began at the corner of Lincoln Way East and Ironwood, where this self-professed father of three stood begging for, quote, any help. A handful of drivers answered his plea by donating money one even handed out a Starbucks hot chocolate. After 90 minutes, the dad crossed traffic, propped himself up against Walgreens, and smoked three cigarettes. Minutes later, he switched corners, displayed a terrible cough, and yanked out an asthma inhaler, a scene on display for hundreds of passing motorists. For someone without excess funds, the costly habit of smoking continued at a nearby gas station. The alleged father then walked 10 city blocks and boarded a transpo bus, which we followed downtown to the UP mall and then back downtown. Our I-team captured the man begging on board the bus, which is against state law, before losing him on the near northwest side, some six hours after first tracking him. Not once was he seen with a child. Excuse me, sir. Only two days later. Hi there. Uh, my name's Kevin Lewis. I'm with WNDU TV. We found the man, known legally as Tracy Glassburn, begging at the corner of Angela and 933. So how much of the money that you uh, make standing on the street goes to uh, your three children? Um, 95% of it. 95% of it is a, is a logical guess because I pay child support. But court records show that's not the case, as Glassburn was arrested last year for failing to pay 24 grand in child support. With your sign saying that you're a father of three children, people maybe picture that you've got this home or an apartment with three kids living there, and, and uh, the sign may be a little bit misleading to motorists passing by? Uh, no, but it's, uh, well, maybe it's all in perception, I guess, that it could be perceived as that, but to have a sign this long to explain the, my whole life, you know, to them. So we'll let this stack of court paperwork do the talking, with at least 25 arrests since 1992 for crimes like battery, possession of paraphernalia used for heroin, and auto theft. Oddly enough, New Center 16 has video of the Chevy station wagon Glassburn stole. Why? Well, because it belonged to a man named Dennis Ostrowski. What do you get? I mean, is it like... Yeah, I'll make about the same. Yeah, it's about $100 an hour. The same Dennis we busted for conning motorists during our first investigative series. It seems dates with the St. Joe County Courthouse are quite common for beggars. Take, for example, panhandler Doug Knox, arrested 23 times in the last 25 years for crimes like battery, driving drunk, and auto theft. We followed Knox on his bike to a friend's house on South Bend's northwest side. My name is Kevin Lewis. I'm with WNDU-TV. A week later, we returned and spoke with the homeowner. Your thoughts about Doug. 
do you feel that he legitimately needs this help, or do you feel like he could be able to get a job on his own? No. Yeah, he could definitely, he could definitely, uh, he, he's so supportive, he could be. Has he ever talked about how much he can make at the corner then? Oh, yeah. Well, he said he pulled in 60 some dollars one day, you know. Tax-free, too. <laughs> right. Not too bad. No, not bad, man. I'm thinking about doing it. <laughs> So we stopped by Knox's Mishawaka apartment for comment. Despite his blue bike sitting outside, no one answered the door. Which brings us back to the intersection of Lincoln Way and Ironwood, and this man named John Lamphere, who further proved the terms panhandler and homeless are not synonymous. We followed Lamphere on a transpo bus from Ironwood to Miami Street, where the 59-year-old bought soda and milk at 7-Eleven. He then walked into an apartment above Harrison's furniture where rent goes for more than $700 a month. Three weeks later, we spotted Lamphere, who claims to be a veteran with an ill wife and two kids doing what he calls hard work. A lot of people may see that apartment and think, heck, I'm in a worse position than this guy is and I'm not even standing on the street corner with a sign. That may be correct. Do you think if most people that drove by knew that you lived there, they'd be more or less inclined to give to you? I haven't got a clue. That's their choice, whatever God puts in their heart. Passing hearts that should know. Lamphere has an extensive criminal record, owns a cell phone, collects military disability, and is an avid smoker. Do you feel like the irony in this is that some people may be worse off than you and donating to you? That's very possible. And you don't have any guilt about that? I don't have guilt for, for to feed my family or myself. No, I don't. So you may be wondering how long these men have been relying on the public's goodwill. The three in this story all set around two years, earning about $20 an hour on average. All three also claim to actively apply for work, yet in all of the hours we followed them, not once do we witness a single job application being filled out. Now coming up tomorrow night just before 6, we'll tell you how our investigation landed a well-known panhandler in jail for weeks. Plus, explain what's led this South Bend father to beg for money street side with his 11 year old son. Then come Thursday night, is any of this legal? New Center 16 sits down with the St. Joseph County prosecutor to break down the do's and don'ts of begging. And we'll also highlight not for profit agencies in our community working tirelessly with the families that truly need the assistance. And Mo, we recognize there's great need sure. in our community, but we're trying to differentiate between homeless and panhandler. And from what we found, most panhandlers are not homeless. Most homeless are not panhandlers. And we want our viewers to be as educated as possible so their hard-earned money doesn't end up in the wrong hands. Right, because we've all been in that car that dr we drive by and the, you know, where it's, the guilt is mm -hmm. tugging at us. What should we do? Yeah. I understand there's a lot more information online. There is. This stack of paperwork right here it is hundreds wow. of pages of misdemeanors of felony charges of the six panhandlers that we followed. And it is a lot of material. It's a lot of reading. If you mm -hmm. want to learn about what they've done, because these stories are just skimming the surface, We've got all the information online, WNDUTV.com. Just click on the story. I'm sure a lot of people make some reading tonight. Yes, it will all make right. for good Kevin's reading. Kevin's got more tomorrow. We've got more ahead. Stay with us. Tonight, just before 6, we continue to uncover the profile of local panhandlers. Last evening, we ousted three men whose cardboard signs were a mere fraction of the truth. Take, for example, this street side beggar named Tracy Glassburn, who claims to care for three kids. So how much of the money that you uh, make standing on the street goes to uh, your three children? Um, 95% of it, 95% of it. Is it that lofty percentage is hard to believe after we learned police arrested Glassburn last year for failing to pay $24,000 in child support and take a look at this guy. Do you consider yourself homeless? No, I'm not homeless. He sure isn't. We followed the 59 year old man named John Lamphere to a $750 a month apartment along South Miami Street in South Bend. Despite owning a cell phone, collecting disability and being an avid smoker, Lamphere told us he has no guilt begging for your hard earned money. 
And so in part two of our series, Profiling a Panhandler, we set out to determine if the men from last night are an anomaly or the street side status quo. Kevin Lewis, Lewis joins us again tonight. And Kevin, part one really resonated with a lot of our viewers. And how could it not, Mo? It's human nature to trust your fellow man. And when that trust is violated, anger tends to set in. You know, so many motorists like to think the five cents or five dollars they're handing out their car window is going toward life essentials. Sad to say, that hope sure hard to come by. Last year, as a stand-in beggar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, ma'am. I learned there was a lot of money. Three dollars. Five dollar bill. Ten dollars. Last one was twenty dollars. Behind sign language. Need money, need food. Please help my family. God bless. The quick cash concept was also simple enough for this man, 29 year old Ryan Hunter, to understand. The self proclaimed single dad needed work or any help. New Center 16 first spotted Hunter at the corner of Angela and 933 on a drizzly Monday morning. Not 15 minutes went by before the destitute dad ate his breakfast, chowing down on McDonald's. All the while, a woman named Jennifer Dolph stood kitty corner to Hunter, raking in the donations with a sign claiming to be a single mother of three. As Hunter filled his stomach in view of passing motorists, Dolph walked to a park bench and pulled out a cell phone. She took a seat and chatted for a bit, counted up her cash, pulled out a pack of cigarettes, and had a smoke. Eight minutes later, she was back to begging, took another short break, and then walked off. Hunter was soon to follow, walking solo into downtown South Bend, where he passed a free meal at a local homeless shelter and instead bought lunch at Taco Bell. He left without ever applying for any of the fast food restaurants, seven current job openings, but found the time to buy a pack of cigarettes at a gas station. Hunter then boarded a transpo bus, which we followed to the University Park Mall, where we lost the single dad in a large crowd, quite confused as to who was caring for his two-year-old son. Excuse me? So we tracked Hunter hey there, down. My name's Kevin Lewis, I'm with WNDU-TV. I'm doing a story on panhandling. I just wanted to talk to you guys, learn a little bit more about your life story. If the woman with Hunter looks familiar, you're right. It's Jennifer Dolph, the panhandler who stood kitty corner from him just a week earlier. No, we couldn't <laughs> help but see that, you know, your sign said that both of you guys are parents. You had a two-year-old son. I think she was a mother of three. Talk about your child and... I really don't want my face on any of this. Right. We're, I, I want no talk, talk about your two-year-old no son, part. though. I want no part of this. Right. Maybe it's because Hunter was arrested last summer. Why? Court documents show he's $8,000 behind in child support payments. The question we have is you ask people for money, you ask people for money every day on the street corner, and don't you feel like you owe it to the people that subsidize your lifestyle to tell them where that money goes? Please get this camera out of my face and this microphone out of my face. Fact is, Hunter has a lengthy rap sheet arrested six times in the last two years. In two cases, he stole hundreds of dollars worth of DVDs from local Walmarts, and only four months ago was allegedly found with a syringe used to inject heroin. Ma'am, let's talk to you here real quick. We saw you on a cell phone begging. How can you be homeless and afford a cell phone? Because it's not my phone. Whose phone is it? It was a friend of mine's phone. And you say you have three children. What are their names? How old are they? I have three daughters. Stop. Like, I don't want them to see me on TV. Where are they? They're with my father. And how much of your money that you make every day goes to your father who's taking care of your three children? Evidently not all of it, as Mishawaka police arrested Dolph last year upon finding a syringe and burnt spoon wrapped in toilet paper sitting in her purse. According to the police report, Dolph told officers both items were used for heroin. <laughs> Since then, the embattled mother has been locked up two more times for shoplifting $1,100 in merchandise. And in January, Dolph violated probation after she stopped attending drug rehab meetings and tested positive for opiates, which heroin is a derivative of. It seems Dolph gets around, 
caught hiding from our news camera in these trees at the corner of Brick and Gumwood in Granger. What do you use your money for? <sighs> to eat, to clothe. Not on this day. We found Dolph toss this entire donation of non-perishable food in the bushes. So much for feeding her three kids. What do you want to tell the person that donates to you? That thank you very much and that I that you'll be blessed by the Lord because I do believe. As for Ryan Hunter, News Center 16 was there as Mishawaka police arrested the 29-year-old for an outstanding warrant. Following his April release, we stopped by Hunter's Western St. Joe County home along Mayflower Road. But the man who has no problem showing his face on the street corner refused to comment to our camera. Now, in all fairness here, one of the seven panhandlers we followed had a story that checked out. The man who we are only calling Robert caught our eye at the corner of State Road 23 in Ironwood, quite frankly, because he was begging with his 11 year old son. We followed the duo in this minivan to a modest home in a middle class South Bend neighborhood. Robert says he, his wife and their six kids got by on 56 grand a year until he was laid off from his church custodian job. Later that same year, he was also let go as a plane mechanic when Northwest Airlines closed its hangar at the South Bend Regional Airport. Now, three and a half years later, unemployment has run out and the bills keep piling up. What was the tipping point where you said the only other option out there is going on the street and, and begging. We drained all our savings account. I had two 401ks. They're gone. Insurance is gone. And um, there was no other money coming in. I'm an aircraft mechanic. I've got, you know, an FAA license to work on million dollar aircraft. And here I am on a corner getting 50 cents or the finger flipped at me because they think I'm just a lazy bum out there, you know, trying trying to get some money. We keep thinking we can't get any worse than we are. At one point, it's going to break and, and we're going to make it. And as for begging with his son, Robert tells us he's never forced any of his kids to tag along. And odd as it may sound, the 48 year old says he sees it as a bonding time talking with his son about life at school and current events. No. Yeah, and so many people are down on their luck and certainly he was and right. he seemed like he tried to keep getting jobs and, and hopefully he will get one. Mm -hmm. When all said and done, you followed how many panhandlers? So we followed seven in total. Only one was legitimate. That was Robert there. Mm -hmm. Still, local police departments, the food pantries, local homeless shelters all say they recommend that you donate to the not-for-profits in our community and not the panhandlers. And this box, this whole uh, yeah. setup of food here is why. These are the non-perishables that Jennifer Dolph, the woman in this story, who said she had three daughters that were all hungry, that needed the food and nourishment. She just threw this into a bush after it was donated to her on the street corner there. This was on the same week that the Salvation Army food pantry up in Niles had no food. They couldn't, yeah. they were turning people away. So the need in our community is absolutely great. We as a community though, just need to be good and smart about where we put those donations, whether it's food, whether it's money. Yeah, and so many of us are tempted to just hand out money. But as you said, if the food pantry shelves are empty and people are throwing this food away, mm -hmm. I think we all know where our, our food and our money needs to go. The best advice I got was the guilt that you have when you pass someone on the street, internalize that and then donate when you get home. Okay, thanks a lot, Kevin. Yeah. Tonight, just before six, we conclude our three-part investigative series profiling a panhandler. Over the last two nights, we've exposed half a dozen beggars lying to thousands of passing motorists at a handful of local intersections. Don't you feel like you owe it to the people that you prey on every single day to give them some type of idea as to where your money goes? Oh my God. Yesterday, we exposed these two panhandlers, both claimed to be needy parents with young children. While that may be true, neither has custody of their kids and both carry extensive criminal records, including arrests for possession of syringes used for heroin. But is panhandling along the road illegal? New Center 16's Kevin Lewis dug through Indiana and Michigan state law. He joins us in the studio tonight with some answers. Kevin. Well, we'll get to Michigan in just a minute, but first police and prosecuting attorneys across Indiana use these two pages of state code stipulations to pinpoint panhandling offenses. The question of legality is a complicated web, but make no mistake. 
Most beggars have reviewed this document from top to bottom better than many attorneys. Later this month, Notre Dame will graduate a legion of new lawyers. Many now scholars of state statutes, an accomplishment six semesters in the making. In that same time, Tracy Glassburn, a convicted felon, has begged for your hard-earned money. A high school dropout, there's one law Glassburn could defend as good as any Golden Dome lawyer in court, the statute of solicitation. I don't believe what I'm doing is panhandling after I've checked into it. Um, uh, panhandling is an illegal act and uh, my, by me holding a sign, it's simply suggestive. Yes, yes. A defense, St. Joe County Prosecutor Mike Dvorak can argue. Uh, our Constitution provides us freedom of association. So uh, we don't live in a society where just standing on a street corner, you can be arrested for a crime. But according to Indiana State statute, there are clear violations you can look out for. Clear as day, or lack thereof, no one can beg after sunset or before sunrise. Panhandlers also can't ask for money at public transit stations, bus stops, or airports. The same rule applies on board buses, including Transpo. Banks and ATMs are also off limits, as are outdoor dining areas. And no peddler can approach, block, touch, swear, or follow any person in attempt to obtain their money. But at that point that they make you feel compelled to donate by swearing at you, by grabbing a hold of you, by touching you, by following you, by doing it after dark, those people are uh, intimidating, they're threatening. And, and that then becomes a misdemeanor offense. So what about begging on the street corner? Prosecutor Dvorak says so long as a panhandler doesn't approach a car or block traffic, the sidewalk is their marketplace. And the difference between the two is that panhandler who comes at you is threatening you, reasonably placing you in fear. The person standing there is not blocking your egress from one direction or another. Uh, and that's the distinction. Still, some beggars ignore the rules with 22 arrests for panhandling in St. Joseph County in the last 24 months. 13 individuals were actually charged, eight of which served more than a week in jail for their crime. In Michigan, the rules were more stringent, with its penal code outlawing anyone begging in a public place. That was until last August when police arrested these two Grand Rapids men. The duo sued the state and won. The court calling Michigan's law unconstitutional. To date, the state legislature hasn't revised the statute, placing the burden on local cities and towns to create their own begging ordinances. But no city, county, or state has a law against lying meaning Ryan Hunter can continue leading people to believe he's collecting money for his two-year-old son. Get this camera out of my face and this microphone out of my face. But instead, pocket every cent for himself. And police can't do a thing. And if you want to believe everything their advertising says or what they may be saying about their need for money, that's up to you. And if you've given it to them under false pretenses, that's not a crime. The statute doesn't provide that that's a criminal act. Earlier today, a viewer messaged me on Facebook asking about charities like the MDA Fill the Boot Drive, which often has volunteers collect money at stoplights. According to Indiana and Michigan law, so long as those individuals have a permit from the local city or town, they are allowed to be there. Turning our attention now to charities in our community, we wanted to know their thoughts about our findings. The Center for the Homeless, which houses more than 200 men, women and children at its facility each night, says there's a definite distinction between homeless and panhandlers. Research out of Indianapolis shows most homeless are not beggars and most beggars are not homeless. That, the center says, is also true here in South Bend. There are a lot of substances out there, you know, we're, you know, we know about crack cocaine and we know about alcohol and we're seeing injectable heroin uh, on the rise in this community. The wisest thing to do really would be to support the agencies that are working tirelessly every day to try to keep these folks uh, afloat. 
You know, if this series has opened your eyes to those in true need across our community, we ask that you donate something to a local not-for-profit, whether it be your time, money, or food. We have a full list of agencies on our website. Just click on this story. Mel. Yeah, because there are so many legitimate causes out there, there you really can are. give your money to, and the person standing at the stoplight, perhaps not the one to exactly. do. Exactly. Okay. And you have also have links, I understand, to Indiana and Michigan laws that are against panhandling as well. Yeah, we do. And using that information, if you see someone begging illegally or a panhandler approaches you on the street, mm -hmm. makes you feel uncomfortable, you have every right to call your local police department and report it. It's a Class C misdemeanor in the state of Indiana. It is an arrestable offense. Okay. An eye-opener. Good job. Yeah. Thanks, Mel.